I just wanted to uh, use this, this short presentation to uh, look at a few historical examples of divestment, as, as Thies has already referred to, as well as the other speakers, and then just look at uh, some of the success in the fossil fuel divestment campaign, and then finally compare some of that to what has been done in the realm of arms control uh, when it comes to divestment. I think, firstly, I should just say that uh, a divestment campaign um, tends to follow a sort of a three-pronged approach, I would say. And firstly, it seeks to stigmatize a certain practice or product. And then secondly, it uh, often seeks to build a, a norm or a legal norm against that practice. And then, of course, thirdly, what it does is it attempts to curtail any financial streams involved in set practice or product. And it's quite interesting that for decades, really, divestment has been a very popular and effective tool for, moments, uh, for movements uh, seeking to enact social change or outlaw certain practices or products. In fact, we can go all the way back to the anti-slavery movements to find some of the seeds for divestment, but it was really the campaign against the apartheid regime in South Africa that first successfully employed the divestment tactic as we, you know, as we see it today. Um, it was in the 1980s when divestment measures targeting the apartheid regime in South Africa were widely adopted by U.S. universities, and actually a prohibition to invest in South Africa was enshrined into a, U, uh, into a federal U.S. law. And it was really that pressure that many commentators credit with, um, with the change in the regime in South Africa. What we've seen is that that particular model, that apartheid divestment campaign model, set the standard for subsequent divestment campaigns, whether it's on child labor, tobacco, and of course, more recently and more successfully, fossil fuels. So on fossil fuels, we've seen in the last decade or so, we've seen a complete proliferation of funds divesting from oil and gas companies. I'll just note some of the, you know, the more um, influential ones. The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which was already referred to earlier by one of the presenter presenters which is the largest such fund in the world with a total value of approximately one trillion US dollars, which is roughly the size of Mexico's economy. It divested from oil and gas companies, or is in the process rather of doing so. Uh, on the eve of the 2014 UN summit on climate change, over 800 global investors pledged to divest around 50 billion US dollars from fossil fuel companies. And I think the most recent positive an impactful push given to this campaign that came last year when the city of New York decided to pull out uh, around five billion in fossil fuel linked money out of its pension fund over the next five years. And a recent study uh, put the total volume of fossil fuel divestment today at around six trillion US dollars. So this campaign is clearly gathering a lot of steam. However, there are just a few qualifiers there that I would like to put. One is that despite this very impressive volume, uh, the share prices of companies are not necessarily affected. And people often make this mistake, thinking that this massively successful divestment campaign has a direct impact on share prices. Studies, uh, studies into different divestment campaigns have actually shown that uh, many of these shares uh, are just reall reallocated from socially responsible investors, so those divesting away from these uh, companies, to more indifferent investors in countries. But that's not to say that it doesn't have a massive effect. You know, as someone uh, put to me once, you know, divestment is not a strategy in itself. It should be seen as a very useful tactic for driving home the message of a broader campaign. You know, and that message is all about creating a stigma. And then the other point I would just like to make when it comes to fossil fuel divestment, and it's an important one, is that, of course, those decisions to divest from oil and gas companies are not always governed by ethical concerns or concerns about the climate. You know, in fact, such concerns can be entirely absent. When it comes to fossil fuel divestment, the risk of stranded assets due to an increased recognition that we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground have moved many investors to drop fossil fuel companies from their portfolio. But that doesn't make it any less impactful. Which moves me to divestment in the domain of arms control and disarmament. Um, before touching briefly on nuclear weapons, I should say that divestment was actually fairly successfully pursued in the domain of arms control and disarmament, targeting landmines, cluster missions, and depleted uranium weapons. 
divestment played a significant role in the Otto and Oslo processes, which led to the mine ban treaty and the convention, convention of cluster missions. And without wanting to get too legalistic, I, I should just say that in those two treaties, sorry, uh, there uh, is not an explicit ban on financing or investing in, the, in, in those weapon systems, but those treaties do include a prohibition to, and I quote, assist, encourage, or induce anyone to engage in any of the activities prohibited, end of quote. And around 40 states' parties to the Cluster Missions Convention, for example, have made subsequent so-called interpretive statements that the financing of those weapons is indeed prohibited under the treaty. That's a very interesting uh, legal phenomenon. Uh, at least 10 of those 40 states actually went further by adopting national legislation prohibiting cluster missions, investments, and financing. We've seen the same with landmines. And that actually does pack a punch. Uh, there's a, um, an organization called the European Social Investment Forum, EuroCIF. And they publish an annual report looking at divestment measures, among other uh, financial developments. And their report in 2016 noted that around 8 trillion euros, that's about a third of Europe's total assets under management, are subject to divestment policies targeting landmines and cluster missions. So that's a very, very impressive volume. Uh, and that really is due to the fact that those treaties have near universal membership. Uh, and there have been very powerful campaigns stigmatizing and delegitimizing those weapons. That has affected the market for those weapons. And I just wanted to share one example that illustrates that. Uh, in 2016, in September, one of the last US companies that was still building cluster bombs, Textron, uh, you can actually find in their securities filing uh, that they decided to stop building cluster bombs and its sites in that securities filing, dwindling demand and the so-called environment brought about the campaigns delegitimizing and prohibiting those weapons. And divestment played a very important role in delegitimizing those weapons. Now, just finally, and I'll end on that, just a few words on nuclear divestment. As Thies already referred to, uh, there has been some measure of success when it comes to nuclear divestment. Nowhere near, of course, what we've seen with fossil fuel divestment, but this has gained some momentum in recent years. Uh, the Norwegian government pension fund divested away from nuclear weapons even before there was a treaty banning nuclear weapons, which is a very interesting. Um, sort of legal move, uh, but I won't go into too much detail there, but there's, it's very interesting to, to, to read the reasoning of the, um, the, um, the council that decided to divest from uh, nuclear weapons for the Norwegian government pension fund. The um, New Zealand government pension fund essentially copied the, uh, well, not copied, but followed the, the decision taken by the Norwegian pension fund. And then we've seen a couple of countries, Switzerland and Liechtenstein, adopt national legislation on divesting from nuclear weapons. There's a new development the, which could uh, spur nuclear divestment movements, and that's the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which includes a prohibition on, similar to the Plus Emissions and Landmines Convention, a prohibition to assist, encourage, or induce in any way nuclear weapons production and other activities prohibited by the treaty. And of course, you could interpret that as meaning uh, financing and investment. However, and this is an important point, and it's not always a popular point, but it should be made, uh, all private companies involved in nuclear weapons production are from either nuclear armed states or states under extended nuclear deterrence agreements. And in addition, and again, it's sort of a, an uncomfortable truth, but all, or virtually all investors, so banks, insurance companies, pension funds, asset managers that invest heavily in these companies are from those states, either nuclear weapon states or states uh, allied to nuclear weapon states. Unfortunately, it's fairly unlikely that any of the nuclear armed states or their allies will join this prohibition, this nuclear weapons prohibition treaty anytime soon. Uh, and that has an effect on the punch that divestment can make. And this is also where the difference, of course, with other disarmament treaties becomes apparent. Anyway, and that's the last, uh, my last point, um, if a fairly large number of states that have signed up to the prohibition treaty, the nuclear weapons prohibition treaty, or not, were to adopt divestment policies as part of their ratification of the treaty or as a standalone law, 
it would go a significant way towards extending the rule of law, and more specifically, the prohibition norm as it relates to nuclear weapons, and would codify the principle that financing, of course, constitutes a form of assistance. So there is, it's an interesting space to watch, uh, and uh, I'm, that could, you know, as I said, pack a real punch. I'll, I'll leave it there, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.